The answer is yes. And the question, does the cold influence affect the infrastructure in Canada? The answer is yes. Here on View from the North with uh, retired businessman Ken Rogers in Kelowna, British Columbia. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hello, Jay. I think that uh, whether cold weather affects uh, infrastructure or not, uh, the best example in the world today is Ukraine. Yes, I totally agree. You know, we in Hawaii, we don't have a sense of exactly what cold means. And when they say, gee, without without energy, you know, oil or gas or what have you, without uh, that uh, Zaporizhia, Zaporizhia uh, power plant, uh, people are going to get really cold. And uh, we don't we don't really understand that. But you do because you're Canadian and it gets really cold in Canada. So what is what is um, cold in in you know to you what does cold in Ukraine mean? Well. Ukraine, geographically, you know, the southern parts of Ukraine, like along the Black Sea, are about the same um, uh, temperature as, um, oh, let's say, um, Iowa or, you know, Oregon, uh, depending on, you know, the weather formation at the time. But the important item is when it gets cold, it can get really cold. Uh, now, lots of Americans would think of Minnesota or North Dakota as, you know, what might be cold. Well, parts of Ukraine are further north and inland from that. And, and so you get, um, you know, 30, 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Um, you know, when you walk on the snow, it squeaks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you, uh, if you, you know, have water coming to your house, um, you know, the pipes have to be, you know, four feet or more deep. Otherwise, the pipe will freeze. Uh, you know, you get uh, lots of pipe freezing, uh, you know, if you um, are not careful and you leave a window open, the pipe might freeze in your house. <laughs> If these buildings uh, didn't have heat, um, you know, what would happen? Could you work in a building without heat? Can the Ukrainians live in a building without heat? No, it, it's just point blank. No, you can't. I mean, no, you can, uh, you know, do a simple item. Like if you were in a, um, a, nor a, you know, a 10 by 10 room, and uh, and you had a couple of candles. The candles would keep the room warm. Wow. You know, you don't need much. It, it's a matter of can it can the heat escape out of the room? You know, uh, like window insulation has to be better. And and uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're. So I, I want to go from that to the question of infrastructure in a place that does get cold and it will be cold in Canada, at least your part of Canada within a week or two. So, you know, what happens to the roads? What happens to the sidewalks? What happens to the electric poles, telephone poles? Um, you know, what happens to the telecommunications in general? What happens when it gets really cold? Well, most of the infrastructure works exactly the same way. You know, if you start off where, with electricity, you know, the when you hang the um, the wires between two telephone poles, uh, when it's going to be cold at some time of the year, you make sure that you have a little more sag in the wire between the two poles, because as it gets cold, it shrinks and and the wire would get tighter. Well, if you strung the wire very tight uh, in the first place, and it's uh, you know 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit temperature the day you hang the wires, and you know you, you think you've done a nice job because they're nice and tight. Well, if it gets cold, the wire will snap. Um, similarly, you've got uh, with your bringing drinking water, you know your water. Um, has your municipality needs a way to make sure they've got 
the water that can be stored um, in a place that will not freeze in depth. So you couldn't have a, um, you know, a, a, you know, a very large pond that's only a couple of feet deep, it might freeze for the whole depth and you would not have your water. Uh, well, it's very rare that something would not be deep enough that uh, that there would be the water underneath the ice uh, to draw upon. But your your pipes to deliver the water to all households has to be deep enough underground. And when it comes into your house, it's got to be underneath your your basement or garage. And you'd you'd have things like uh, in a city like Edmonton. Uh, it's very rare that you don't have a basement that's, uh, you know, at least five feet. The floor is at least five feet below the surface. Mm -hmm. What about roads? Um, roads, uh, little roads and big roads and turnpikes and freeways. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, in my childhood in New York, um, they would uh, put salt on the roads. And the salt would melt the snow, and that was good. But then the salt would eat the pavement. Um, and at the end of the cold season, the, the pavement needed to be repaired or replaced. What What do you do customarily in Canada about that? Well, in in New York, you don't need to salt very often. If hmm. you're in, if you're in, you know, most Canadian cities, you know, the first thing you have is major snow removal. You know, and you have that in in lots of the larger American cities. So, you know, whether it's uh, Chicago or Buffalo or Minneapolis, uh, you know, there's major snow removal first, but you also do the salting, and that you then have um, extreme difficulty with things like mountain passes, uh, for example, um, uh, just inland from Seattle. Are, are a couple of very um, Canadian type mountain passes mm -hmm. uh, called, you know, Snoqualmie uh, Pass, a wonderful, wonderful ski area. But uh, in the winter time, you know, they have, um, you know, snow removal going, you know, 24 hours a day if it's needed. And uh, you've got to drive very cautiously going over the top and, and they do, salt as well um you know but snow removal is the main factor you know and in in places like vancouver where it's very very rare that it's it, that it's cold but you know every year you manage to get a snowfall you know three or four inches fall falls and and nobody has uh, special tires on their cars like mm -hmm. you have what are called snow tires and um, you know, if you're going on any mountain pass in Canada, it's legally required. You can't go in the road unless you have snow tires. No, they don't have great inspection, but nobody's stupid enough to try it. What <laughs> about chains? Chains are the, one step further than snow tires, yeah? Yes, but most people are unable to put chains on their car. I mean, chains work for large trucks. The truckers are good at, at putting the chains on, uh, you know, the wheel wells are, are more accessible than on a car. You know, the car has lowered the ground. and Where I want to go with this is my, my, my guess would be that when you have cold weather, you have to spend more money um, designing, building, maintaining, repairing infrastructure like roads, like uh, power, power, you know, power uh, lines, like telecommunication lines. Um, like airports, like, you know, infrastructure in general for every city, uh, water, um, because because the cold has an effect and the change in, in temperature has an effect. This may not always be the case. One day, maybe soon, we'll have everything really warm with climate change. But for now, it still gets cold. And um, I guess my question to you is, 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 am I right to assume that Canada in general spends more money on designing, maintaining, repairing infrastructure of all kinds against the change in weather in the winter. Yes, 
you know, but the economics are very similar to, you know, the whole idea of infrastructure is that if you, you know, spend a dollar on, on infrastructure, you usually get uh, benefit, uh, you know, economically, but alone of about three dollars uh, uh, towards GDP over time. But more than that, I think of infrastructure as really what it, it it's not just an economic issue. It's, it's how does it affect a way of life? You know, if you simply start with Hawaii and you say, um, walk out on to any street in Hawaii and, and it's uplifting. You know, you, you have a view of the ocean, you have the wonderful vegetation. Uh, similarly, in a city like Vancouver, it's, it's absolutely a gorgeous setting where if you pick, you know, some place like Midland, Texas, out in the flats and, you know, or, or, you know, the Salt Lake Desert, uh, uh, just west of Salt Lake City, you know, it's, it's, you know, not uplifting at all. <laughs> so, so you have, um, you know, the, it, the environment you start with is there. Well, then if you're going to put in, you start doing some infrastructure, you know, such as, you know, you build a freeway. Well, right away, you've spoiled other things. You know, anybody that lives near that freeway, especially a little uphill from it, has, has horrific noise damage. You know, you get cities like uh, Calgary in, in Alberta in Canada. Um, back when I was uh, young and a and senior planner for the city, we built uh, some sound attenuation barriers whenever we were widening any of the freeways. And, uh, and those barriers enabled, uh, you know, uh, the ability to build a, you know, million dollar single family home on the other side of the barrier, but really within a few feet of the of the freeway, uh, which you can't do in other places. Well, I'm, I'm wondering also whether um, the Canadian model, both uh, at the at the provincial level and, and the federal level, uh, attends to infrastructure, uh, whether you can say that, you know, they're out there working they're out there improving it. Um, you have a reasonable level of confidence that it won't be falling apart. You know, in Hawaii, you may be uplifting, but the roads are falling apart. We've had a, a war against potholes going on for a long time. And some people say that's because we don't put enough macadam down uh, when we're, we're fixing the roads. Um, I remember a, a, a trip my wife and I took to Italy not too many years ago where on every Italian highway, um, there were guys working, um, fixing. And I said, what is, what is all this? Why are they working and fixing on the roads? Well, because that's what they do. They insist on having good roads. So they work on the roads all the time. We don't do that. I don't know if that's happening in Canada. And I, I kind of doubt that it's happening in, in, in the mainland US, um, simply because when um, Joe Biden, you know, looked at the question of infrastructure. Uh, he found that it was um, not being maintained all over the country. Um, and of course, the best way is the Italian way to just keep on working on it, um, not just letting it and abandoning it for decades at a time. What happens in Canada? Well, the, the story is different. And, and much like the U.S., a lot of the problems with infrastructure is which level of government's responsible for what you know you have the three levels of government the municipal provincial or state government in the u.s and then the federal well in canada the federal government has all the taxing power the municipality has the majority of the responsibility for infrastructure you know so depending on the province uh, you have a very, very different situation in Canada. You know, Alberta, uh, as a province, has the highest uh, GDP per capita in Canada, much like Massachusetts has in the U.S., um, but for different reasons. But in Alberta, you've got uh, a gorgeous highway running from 
some town that's nowhere to somewhere of lesser importance. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, and they're really well maintained. Now they have a, a combination of, um, of they contract with uh, some road firm, um, you know, a private enterprise with on a maintenance agreement and they maintain, you know, a particular stretch of a highway uh, uh, and they take the risk whether the weather's better or worse. Um, you go in the um, mountain passes, uh, you always have, uh, you know, it's a government funded snow removal uh, situation um, where in the US an awful lot of the infrastructure problems are relate to the obsession by some American governments, especially state governments, that everything and anything should be private enterprise, where where really that doesn't work <laughs> to your best benefit most of the time. You know, the simplest infrastructure example is is healthcare compare Cuba with the US. You know, in the US, uh, the because of the idea that private industry should do absolutely everything, you know, that government can't do it as efficiently or whatever. Um, well, really, uh, in, in the United States, the wealthy person has the best health care in the world. The, the poorest 25% have worse health care than Cuba, than the poorest 25% in Cuba. And Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. Well, I'm just an, an interesting question because the more you look, including in Hawaii, the more you find that um, you know, governments are delegating uh, infrastructure maintenance, well, every aspect of infrastructure to contractors under contracts. And, uh, you know, man, for example, I was on the neighborhood board here in my neighborhood. And every time the city showed up to report on what was going on, I said, do you, do you have a list of the roads that you're supposed, supposed to be fixing uh, and the priorities? Um, and every time I asked that question, um, they, they, <laughs> <laughs> they had to go somewhere. Uh, they never answered the question. And, and I, I don't think there was a list anywhere. Um, so, I mean, the idea is that there was nobody out there um, working directly for the municipality uh, responsible to identify the roads that needed fixing and to fix them. Uh, and so you, you sort of wait until the public uh, gets really irritated, and then you have a big contract to, you know, to fix a lot of infrastructure too late at the same time. Um, one other little story, and I'll stop. But you know, back in the '90s, uh, the Secretary of uh, Energy, a guy named uh, Spencer Abram, and uh, one day the Northeast Grid went out, and it was a whole combination of reasons. But uh, the, the Northeast Grid failed, and it failed for a lot of people, for millions of people. And they came to Spencer Abram and they said, "What happened, to you? How come you let this fail?" And his response sticks in my mind even till today, after all these years. He said, what are you talking about? The grid was built like in the 50s. No municipality, no state, no federal government, um, you know, maintained it or designed or, or repaired it in the way it should have been repaired and maintained. What do you expect? If you don't repair infrastructure, <laughs> it fails, buddy. <laughs> don't look at me. And he was right. And, and I think that there's a, you know, that's a kind of a virus that's all over the U.S. You know, you wait till it fails, wait till the bridge collapses, and then you address it. Does that happen in Canada? Yes, uh, and and you get the same situation as in the U.S. For example, if you have uh, hired a, a major road contractor to look after a, a section of of freeway, you know, and they're contracted to do the maintenance over a period of of years. Well, what tends to be the normal case in the United States, especially, and it's hit and miss in Canada, is that the in America, there's just kind of blindly the politicians assume that the contractor will do a wonderful job. 
you know, in in Canada, that we at least start with the idea that that they may only be as honest as they have to be. Therefore, if we don't inspect or check up on it, you know, it, then you know we may get cheated. You know, and so you know the hit and miss is in some places and for some situations, the Canadian when a private industry is looking after something like a, a nursing home or a senior citizen's home, then there is an, a government inspection checking it out. You know, but in some provinces, the same has happened in the US when COVID-19 shows up, uh, you know, all the seniors die because nobody gave a hoot or nobody mm. did the right job. Nobody fixed the road or fixed the healthcare. Uh, and and it's not much better when you reverse it. You know, if if the government's supposed to be doing something, you know, there's nobody checking that they're doing a good job. <laughs> well, suppose I suppose I gave you a another world, a world where the government had the guy with the shovel. He was a government employee, okay, and the government had engineers that organized all this and and uh, and had and used the technology to determine the useful life uh, of these infrastructure elements and actually went out there at the end of the theoretical useful life and, and fixed it, maintained it. And they were ready at a moment's notice to go and fix that road or fix that wire um, or, or fix that facility, whatever it was. Um, government facility done by government, done by government agencies, government um, management, government employees. Would that be better? Do we know enough to answer that question generally? Uh, or does that also depend on, you know, the, the government in question, the province or the state in question? As a general rule, would it be better if government did it itself? Well, two examples I know of, uh, you know, both in Alberta, Calgary and Edmonton, uh, they municipalities have a large engineering department. They employ people. They look after all that infrastructure and they do a crackerjack job. Um, there is not, you know, there's simply, you know, if the public doesn't like a road and they complain, you know, it does move through the system and, and get some attention. Now, um, I'm not that familiar with which level of government's responsible in other places, but uh, certainly, um, you know, in the uh, central Okanagan area of British Columbia, uh, you know, it is not nearly as good as it is in, in those areas in Alberta. Um, so that <clears throat> I would guess it's hit and miss uh, with government really, uh, you know, I, my underlying philosophy kind of to repeat a point is if government's responsible to do something, you need a mechanism by which their the quality of job that they're doing is audited by somebody, you know, and similarly, if private industry is doing it, you better have some government agency auditing that they are doing it properly. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I don't think you can be assured that infrastructure is as good as it should be. Well, you know, I, I was struck with, um, you know, the idea and Trump, Trump was promising he would spend money on infrastructure, never did. Uh, and then when Joe Biden got in office, he, he was able to get uh, some kind of bipartisan bill through um, laying, you know, hundreds of billions on infrastructure all of a sudden. And I, I said to myself, well, you know what this means to me, it's not so much that um, he's organizing um, the repair and maintenance of infrastructure. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a good thing by itself, but he's really saying that we are behind. We are behind by hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and we, we were not paying attention <laughs> and when this money that he got Congress to uh, <clears throat> appropriate for infrastructure, when this money is spent, what then? <clears throat> How long do we have to wait uh, for this to happen again? The scenario repeats itself uh, like a news cycle. 
Uh, you wait until everything collapses and crumbles. You wait till the bridge falls in the river. And so, oh, yeah, well, now we have to spend some money on infrastructure. You know, I find this completely inadequate as a long-term solution. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that be, because of the cold, because Canada is Canada, that you don't have the problem that we have. Um, and I mean, including Hawaii, where, you know, you have to have a political crisis before you actually fix anything. I'm not sure that I would agree with that fully. I, I think my experience, uh, you know, traveling extensively in both countries, um, you know, that Canada generally is is better with its infrastructure than the U.S., but we also have some blatant disgraces. Uh, you know, we have these um, uh, native communities scattered all over the place in Canada, like Canada has about 6% of its population is, is native and a good percentage of them live on in native reservations, let's call them, and, and uh, they're in remote locations and, and the federal government has been responsible for their infrastructure uh, forever and ever. And, uh, and it is absolutely disgraceful. We probably have, um, you know, half the India in native communities in Canada don't have clean drinking water. <laughs> and we got 20% of the world's fresh water. <laughs> that, that is really hard to understand. But let me know, it reminds me, if you will, um, of some shows we have had with, um, you know, with lawyers and uh, I guess we call them... Um, um, those who seek... Uh, equity justice um, in, in Bogota, Colombia. Um, I know you spent time down there, uh, in that area. And, and what, what, what I was uh, struck with was one lawyer who was responsible in his firm for raising capital and building infrastructure into the hinterland of Colombia. Um, and and P.S., um, you know, Colombia, like many South American, Latin American countries has these cities of gleaming um, steel and, and glass. But then, you know, 10 miles out, outside the city, you have jungle uh, and you have these, um, these, these towns and villages in the hinterland that are completely undeveloped. And his, um, his mission in life and his vision for his own, for his own you know, way of helping um, was to build infrastructure to these towns and villages. Why? Because if you build infrastructure, then you get knowledge, you get the internet, um, you get the ability of government um, emissaries to do their jobs in these places. You uh, reduce the operations of the, the FARC, you know, the guerrillas out there in the hinterland. And you essentially bring the country together and avoid the fragmentation and violence that you might otherwise have if you could not reach uh, these, these, uh, these rural areas. Um, and he felt that that was a way to you know, um, make a better life for everyone if you could connect the country. But connecting the country was a matter of infrastructure. Now, it's not exactly the same in the US. Um, because um, there's not too many places like that, but there are some, there are some rural areas that are not being reached, whether it be the digital divide, whether it be, um, you know, any number of economic things, governmental things that are not reaching these areas and, and they are, are, they're suffering, whether they realize it or not, they're disconnected. Infrastructure connects. What are your thoughts about that, Ken? Well, just to, when you mentioned um, internet, uh, you know, as I understand, there's between five and ten percent of uh, of American citizens live in locations that they don't have broadband. Now, that's that's an absolute disgrace. <laughs> um, the but the idea to me of infrastructure is is that it is. Um, something that is designed it's a an asset that increases the standard of living of the 
people where that infrastructure and fault. Now, whether you call it well-being or standard of living, I don't make a great distinction. It's not solely an economic thing. You know, if you're if you're going to have an airport and you've got lots more planes, you know, the good news is your your airport uh, does certain things, but somebody lives in the flight path, you know, and and so they're well-being or standard of living is reduced uh, because they they've got to deal with the noise similarly you put in a you know in los angeles uh, you know you've got freeways uh, that make it so you can certainly get around easily uh, but on the other hand most of the street freeways are are on concrete stilts and uh, they're you know there's housing and other people living beneath the freeways you know and and they're really unsightly they're not they're not that noisy because the sound goes up and you know the people are living below but certainly compared to walking down kalakawa avenue in hawaii you know it's a really ugly scene you know it's, there's mm -hmm. it spoils the the standard of living or the well-being of the people and destroys the neighborhoods below and around yes you know but uh you know inconsistent uh, you know infrastructure it exists all around the world uh, you know it's it's you know when you have an older city or let's let's take even a new sparkly city like vancouver you know, if you want to, because the city's population has ex, has grown greatly over the last few years, you know, they're, they're trying to improve the subway system. Well, well, how do you create a subway after you've already got, you know, a pretty big city sitting above ground? You know, you, you know if you're going to close down a street, it's going to cost you billions of dollars for just a few miles of of subway so that uh, you know there's not an easy solution all the way around it's simply to recognize that infrastructure is important economically if you use a simple example one of the you know best infrastructure things the world ever saw was when eisenhower created all the u.s interstate highway system where those freeways go through every city so that you know if you're going you know down the west coast and and you're going to go through seattle you can go through the whole city on a freeway now if you try to go through any city you know and, and perhaps the worst might be new york you know without being on a freeway um and uh you know on your freeway you're doing 75 miles an hour and if you're going a lot of miles, uh, some of which is in the country as opposed to only in the city, you'd be lucky to do 50 miles an hour average if you didn't have that freeway. Well, that's one and a half times as as fast so that the driver, you know, he should he if he gets paid for delivering the goods from point A to point B, you know, if he has to go on a on a back road instead of a freeway, he should only get two thirds as much money. You know, like, like nice like trying to give it the equation of how does it affect economics? You know, it, it's it's pretty blatantly obvious. Yeah, but you can actually make a you can make a model. You can make a chart. There are lots of those models out there. You know, like the. A uh, U.S. or the American Society of Civil Engineers does a um, a report every year on the U.S. infrastructure. Now, they they have their normal bias of you know they're civil engineers. They like to build things like roads, bridges, buildings, etc. You know whether it's uh, you know water, fresh water, or waterways or any infrastructure, and so. They, they have all kinds of models for rating uh, different infrastructure. You know, they mm, give yeah. the uh, example, a, uh, the most recent report, you know, says that, um, you know, railroads delivering freight 
get sort of a a B a B mark. You know, your A B C D gives your grade, eh? So they get a fairly good grade for delivering freight. You know, but the passenger traffic gets sort of a D minus. <laughs> you know, and 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 I could agree with that. I recently rode in a Amtrak train from from Newark Airport to Penn Station in downtown New York. Well, the train just shook back back and forth sideways, and it was the most ancient, uh, you know, train coach that I've seen in many many years. It reminded me of a trip I took across Canada and on a train in, when I was uh, 23 years old, going from Montreal to to the Western Canada, and you know, the, at least the uh, train back in those days I thought was not too bad, but this. Amtrak looked like the leftover coach from 50, 60 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, and it was really, you know, it it made it, you know, but, you know, you, you knew the tracks needed repair, the, the, you know, coach itself was terrible. You know, Penn Station was nothing to write home about either. And, and so, you know, I, I would agree with the, you know, American Society of Civil Engineers saying, you know, the American uh, passenger railroad infrastructure is a disgrace relative to the, you know, GDP of the United States. I mean, you've got places like Japan with a gorgeous high speed rail, you know, Taiwan has it, uh, China has it. I mean, some really poor countries got way better you know passenger rail service than the u.s yeah <clears throat> going back to the point of uh you know um having government attend to this having government structure itself um so that it pays attention i, I think there's a natural um inclination in this country and maybe to some degree in every democracy uh if if you put the infrastructure in there in the 50s it must still be working as long, as long as it's not falling in the river. You don't have to do anything about it. And this is a mistake. Um, you have to pay attention to it all over the country. I'm thinking of Flint, Michigan and the water. Nobody paid attention. And uh, now the population of Flint, um, you know, was pretty ticked off about the water. And this, this is, uh, you know, exhibited in so many places in so many ways, um, not, not just, uh, you know, the train into Manhattan. So I think, I think we need to rethink infrastructure in this country. And maybe to a lesser degree, we need to rethink infrastructure in Canada and various other democracies. It's interesting too, that the newer countries, the ones that built those high-speed rail uh, facilities only you know 10 years ago, uh, they're way be better off than we are. Although I would say that those countries probably pay more attention to maintaining the high speed rail uh, than we spend maintaining the low speed rail. Um, in any event, <clears throat> infrastructure is a big is a big category of things. It includes so many things. It, it, the idea is it includes things that 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 people expect the government to either do or or manage. And I don't think we can be cavalier about it. Your final thoughts? Well. I think the uh, U.S. Biden's infrastructure bill is is really a, a wonderful step in the right direction. Uh, in studying the detail, I thought saw one piece that I thought was missing. You know, there, there's effort to deal with um, with water infrastructure, like the Flint, Michigan problem. You know, as if drinking water is a human right kind of thing. Whereas um, there was nothing to do with a large irrigation projects, you know, I, as I think that that, um, you know, the Central Valley in California is one of the major assets the United States has and something that, you know, Hawaiians would understand if you have to bring all your food in from somewhere else, you got a major problem. 
you know, you, you need to be more self-sufficient on certain things. One and food is a major one of those. And to let the let the uh, Central Valley die because of lack of water, which is really what's going to happen if there isn't infrastructure to get additional water there, you know, whether you're going to run a pipeline from the mouth of the Columbia River down to California or not, I think it's a lot better investment than than fixing Fort Myers, Florida, that's going to flood again. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> So much more to discuss, Ken. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks hence, and we'll make other comparisons and lessons between Canada and the U.S. I look forward to these conversations. I learned so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ken Rogers. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.